Andrew's experiment simply shows the behavior of real gas. Andrew carried out this experiment in 1863 using carbon dioxide as a test gas and he came up with some conditions that we shall be discussing and many more coming up. Now right before us is just a diagram that shows the apparatus that was used by Andrew when he was trying to carry out his experiments. Like I have earlier intimated when he was carrying out his experiment he was basing, he was basically using dry carbon dioxide which is right in there and in this portion here is dry nitrogen. Of course now this is mercury, um, we have a watertight casing right there and in here is water, At it's, it's called a constant water bath. So this is the setup of the experiment. We have screw, we have screws for adjusting pressure. So meaning if I wanted to adjust the pressure inside this bath, I simply adjust that screw and these threads either go in or out and depending on the configuration of those threads, the pressure inside here is regulated. So to go ahead and describe how he carried out his experiments, you can say that dry carbon dioxide and dry nitrogen or you can call it dry air are trapped in these capillary tubes you're seeing right there with mercury down here and those ones trapped up there. Now of course the tubes that we are talking about are uh, placed and supported in water or they are in the, they are immersed in a, in a water bath, they call it a constant water bath to ensure that the temperature around these or the temperature that is aff affecting these trapped gases is constant. That's the function of this constant water bath. Remember this is an experiment where we are trying to regulate the pressure and the volume of these trapped gases. So when it comes to regulating the amount of pressure that is experienced by these gases that are trapped up here, we are going to regulate those pressures using these screws. So when we adjust this screw, we are in essence uh, adjusting the amount of pressure inside this system. And as we are adjusting the amount of pressure inside this, this system, the volume is also affected in a way. So you will adjust these screws when you've put in a, a constant water bath, that is water at a certain temperature that is known, and you notice, you, you monitor, you, you record the pressure of these adjustable screws and the, the respective volumes of inside here. Then definitely you will change this water and you put in water at a different temperature or at, uh, you change the constant temperature bath and you put in water at different temperature adjust these screws accordingly and then you monitor the volume. So in other words, you're going to keep continuing doing that. You repeat this experiment that all the illustrations that I've been telling you, the illustration of adjusting these screws to monitor the pressure and volume, but you're going to keep repeating it using different temperatures. And how do you ensure that the temperatures are different? By simply changing this water bath or by changing the temperature of this water, you, uh, you put in fresh water at a different temperature and you monitor the pressure and volume of these trapped gases. When Andrew kept carrying out that experiment, he came up with a graph. This graph right here is what I am talking about. It's a graph of pressure against volume. This is the volume axis, the pressure axis, and these lines we are seeing, these green lines are isothermals. If we might look at this one, for example, the first one, this is an isothermal at a temperature of 13 degrees Celsius. Now this means that when he was carrying out this experiment, the constant water bath was at that temperature, 13. So when the temperature was 13, the pressure and volume were varying like that. So when he changed and he put in another water bath or when he raised the temperature of the constant water bath, the, let's say from 13 degrees to 21.5, this is an isothermal. So this isothermal, by isothermal I mean a line at constant temperature. This is a line co representing constant temperature. So this is how pressure and volume varies at temperature like that. So at 31.1 degrees Celsius, the temperature varies like that. Then again, at 35.5 degrees Celsius, the temperature varies like that. Then at 48.1 degrees Celsius, the temperature varies like that. Now when you look at some other features of this graph, you see that we are having 
this the dotted bit the bit where it is dotted this region right here is the liquid phase it means that in this phase the gas is liquid then in this phase it is a mixture of the liquid and the saturated vapor then down here is an unsaturated vapor right there now let's first get into some terminologies before we get into explaining this some of these features of the graph now some of these terminologies that you must be knowing we have what we call the critical temperature now the critical temperature is simply the temperature above which a gas cannot be liquefied no matter how great the pressure is and when we look at this graph we have this isothermal right there this isothermal is for for for, for this particular case is 31.1 degrees celsius it might vary it might is 31.5 degrees celsius now this isothermal is what we are calling the critical temperature now in when you look at this critical temperature above this critical temperature we are having the gas the real gas is in a gaseous form and then below that critical temperature below this isothermal you're seeing that the gas is either in liquid phase or it is a saturated vapor or it is an unsaturated vapor so this critical temperature its definition is the temperature above which a gas cannot be liquefied if you realize here above this isothermal the gas cannot is is not it, it can't be liquefied however much how, whatever the pressure is if you however much you increase the pressure the as you can see the isothermals show that the gas will remain in its gaseous state so that's what we are calling the critical temperature now of course if this is being our critical temperature for this particular graph then we have what we call the critical pressure the critical pressure in this case is at that point corresponding to that point right there and by definition what is our critical pressure our critical, pre our critical pressure is simply the minimum pressure that will cause liquefaction of a gas at its critical temperature so if you look at this pressure it is just the minimum pressure that will cause liquefaction of a gas at this critical temperature so this being the minimum pressure that will cause liquefaction of a gas at its critical temperature of course uh, for Andrew he used carbon dioxide and for carbon and for carbon dioxide it is around 73 atmospheres or call it 73 pascals but this figure varies when it comes to other gases so there is also what we call specific critical volume specific critical volume is right there it is the volume that is corresponding to the critical pressure the specific critical volume is the volume occupied by one kilogram of a gas at its critical temperature and critical pressure now of course other terminologies that we may be interested in is first of all a gas is the term that is applied to a substance which is in gaseous state right there and of course it is always above its critical temperature and of course speaking of vapor right this section here is what we are looking at vapor this the vapor is found in this section and in this section we are having a mixture of liquid and saturated vapor and of course vapor is simply the term that is applied to a substance which is in the gaseous phase which is right here it is in the gaseous phase and it is below the critical temperature so basically when you if you to look at this you have this isothermal this is what we are calling this isothermal is representing the critical temperature but then we have the anisothermal above it right here which is representing uh, the next temperature above this isothermal then we have these isothermals below which are isothermals that are below this critical temperature when we look at this graph we're able to sh see that this graph shows that real gases can actually be liquefied if they are compressed by applying pressure below the critical temperature of course above the critical temperature real gases cannot be liquefied but if you apply pressure at temperatures that are below this critical temperature you realize that actually real gases can be liquefied if i may label three of these isotherms to illustrate something i'll call this iso i'll call this isotherm a this is isotherm b this is isotherm c 
Now if you look at isotherm C, it's running from down here, first in the gaseous state, then it becomes, it gets into that level, then like that. Now this isotherm C is simply an isotherm that shows the behavior of real gases below their critical temperature. If you look at isotherm B, which is right there, you see that it is an isotherm that is showing the behavior of real gases at critical temperature. And if you look at isotherm A, it is representative of all isotherms above the critical temperature. And definitely it is an isotherm that shows behavior of real gases above the critical temperature. Now, if you realize that as these isotherms, as you continue the temperatures going up, as the temperatures keep increasing, you realize that the real gases start behaving like ideal gases. So, in other words, real gases will always behave like real gases when you go above critical temperature. These isotherms keep, keep getting more and more straight and more straight as the temperatures keep increasing. Let's examine this isotherm right here. Now in my next diagram, I am going to isolate this isotherm down here. This isotherm I have labeled isotherm Roman 1. I'm going to isolate it and explain it in detail. It is right there. I have labeled it A, B, C, and D. Now at A, right here, like I had shown you in our previous picture, this is where the gaseous state is. The vapor right here is unsaturated. So at A, the gas is still at gaseous state. So as the volume keeps reducing as a result of this pressure increase, it goes to B. Now along AB, we are seeing that the vapor is unsaturated. And as you can see, it fairly obeys Boyle's law. Now, of course, as the pressure is gradually increased, this isotherm is going to go and reach at point B. When it reaches at point B, the process of liquefaction begins. When the process of liquefaction begins, it will begin along BC. So along BC, it's the process where liquefaction is beginning. In, in, in other words, along BC, the vapor is saturated and the vapor pressure remains constant at this level because this saturated vapor is in equili dynamic equilibrium with its liquid. In other words, the gas, the, the gas is converting to liquid state. It's in dynamic equilibrium with its liquid, so it's going to take place from B to C. So along BC, the vapor continues to condense until we reach point C, whereby the entire vapor has condensed into a liquid. When at point C, the entire vapor condenses and becomes a liquid, you realize that there is a, the, the vapor behaves differently and it increases drastically from C to D. The, the pressure increases. When you increase the pressure from C to D, you realize that the volume this doesn't almost increase. So from C to D, the pressure increases, and actually from C to D, the entire the, 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 we are now in the liquid state. But now the liquid state, you realize that a very high increase in pressure is not corresponding to any significant increase in volume, any significant decrease in volume, and this is simply because liquids are incompressible. This brings us to the end of this video. Thanks for watching. Feel free to check out other excellent videos on the channel and don't forget to subscribe. For Kisembo Academy, this is Anwar Rangakuramia helping you manifest excellence.